coming to you live from Bulgaria. Here we go. There she goes. Walking backwards. I can't walk backwards. I'm being watched off the deck of the good ship Santana. Okay, good morning, Timothy, once again. <laughs> Thank you for the, <laughs> the cheering up. So I hope that uh, all is good with you uh, and to everybody in Clubhouse and uh, also LinkedIn and YouTube who is watching us. Good morning and thank you for joining. So this is the 134th episode of Japanese Politics One-on-One -on -one with Timothy Langley and me uh, as a host, Maya Matsuoka. Of course, you already know um, how we start and that I don't want to keep Timothy waiting because otherwise he's going, well, his uh, stage fever is going to drive him crazy. He's got just the right amount of make wake up, no, makeup today. So please enjoy and Timothy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you very much uh, to the audience and everybody who joins us every week. As Maya said, this is our 134th consecutive Sunday together. I'm not on the good ship Santana. I am back in my home office today to give you news. I try to encapsulate this within 30 minutes, but it was pointed out to me in a very friendly post this last week um, that I never really stick to 30 minutes. It really goes over 30 minutes, um, sometimes um, almost an hour, but there is a lot to talk about. Even though when Maya and I first started this 134 weeks ago, um, there was a little bit of curiosity about, um, you know, the movement in Japanese politics and how much the appetite would be. But you've rewarded us with, a, you know, great feedback. We, we do the one hour briefing or the 30 minute briefing, whichever way it goes. And we have a Q&A that's uh, managed by Maya. So if during the briefing you have questions, you know, ping Maya right to her either over uh, LinkedIn or on Clubhouse. And we usually have a really great um, uh, and vibrant session. Let me tell you what we're going to talk about today because there's a lot going on. Uh, this is September 3rd, uh, 2023, two days away from what was, you know, the great Kanto earthquake 100 years ago. So there were a lot of commemorative uh, events that went on over the uh, on Friday. Um, if you picked up any newspaper, then you were, um, you know, regaled with photographs, um, touch ups of what happened to Yokohama and uh, and uh, Tokyo. 90% um, of the people, more than 100,000 people died, 90% of them uh, perished due to fire, not to earthquake or things falling on them, or the uh, uh, maybe 20 uh, foot high uh, tsunami that hit in um, Sugami Bay, hit um, Kamakura and Zushi, uh, that area there. But the earthquake was centered around uh, Sagami Bay, so the massive uh, tsunami that hit within minutes of the earthquake, um, hit the coastal region there. It did have a little bit of impact in the Tokyo Bay, which is, you know, separated by the uh, Yokohama Peninsula. Um, but uh, it was the, um, the fact that the earthquake happened just before noon when people were preparing for the noon meal. And that really caused the uh, conflagration that really destroyed um, maybe uh, 40% of the houses and the, the structures in Tokyo. So it was a devastating thing that happened. As a consequence of that, the United States sent um, a lot of supplies. Um, the destroyers that were in uh, Hong Kong and in, um, um, in, the, in the region for supplies and rescue and, and support, it received a huge um, um, you know, appreciation from the Japanese government, from the Japanese people at the time. And also, you remember when we had uh, the... Um, the 311 uh, triple disaster here, a lot of the foreigners left Japan. They were just uh, terrified from the, the nuclear explosion and, and everything else. And they were called fly genes. Um, you might remember that, that term. Um, a hundred years ago, there were also fly genes um, uh, in Yokohama. Most of the uh, foreign community was based in Yokohama at the time. A couple of the um, mission um, leaders from, from France, uh, some of them weren't, weren't quite official embassies at that point, but everybody was focused um, on the hills of, of Yokohama, as you know now. Um, and uh, several of them were killed in, in falling debris and collapsed buildings. Uh, but many of them uh, fled the 
ships from Japan, uh, from the United States came into the harbor and they helped with uh, rescue and um, uh, food and supplies, that sort of thing. But they also left with many, many foreigners who just, I mean, the, the whole city was just devastated. So it was a big event for Japan. Um, following uh, this, the uh, level of appreciation the United States uh, perceived coming from Japan seemed to be diminished and seemed to be inconsequential compared to how much. Can you turn your mic off, please, Maya? Even though I do look forward to hearing the bar, the dog's bark. Oh. Thank you. Um, there, the, the tension between uh, the United States and Japan began to increase during that period of time, and it was less than 15 years later that, um, you know, the incursions for, uh, um, you know, South Korea or the Korean Peninsula, Manchuria, um, and later um, China began during that period of time. So it was a good period of time before the earthquake, but it really did change a lot of things. Moving on, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the points that I'm going to um, discuss today. The economy is looking a little bit sour. Um, the, um, the number of jobs opened for the number of people who are looking for jobs is beginning to fall. They've just broke ground in Hokkaido for Rapidus, which is a huge a semiconductor production facility. It's received a lot of news. They just broke ground in Hokkaido, but they're wondering how they're going to be able to staff it with the number of technicians. Everybody's looking for highly skilled um, technical people from, you know, um, university or uh, graduate schools. There just aren't that many. The population decline continues unabated in Japan. Uh, there's a couple of stories out on corporate malfeasance. You know, the number of and quality of crimes in Japan, it's uh, compared to other Western countries, there's not a lot of robbery, there's not a lot of physical violence, but there's a lot of criminal um, uh, activities that goes on within these corporations. And I'm talking about, um, you know, big companies that do bad things and finally they get caught and nailed with it. One of those is uh, this joint venture between MUFJ and Morgan Stanley. They've been uh, slapped around for um, selling uh, bonds that were a little bit risky. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And also what's going on with Johnny and Associates, all, all, also known as Johnny's Gym Show. There's some news going on about that that I want to get into. Defense spending, as you know, the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Kishida promised that uh, the defense spending um, along um, sought after goal by the um, the LDP would be increased from 1% of GDP to 2% of GDP. It looks like, uh, based on the numbers that are being reported, GDP will have to be um, revised um, on Friday. Friday, they come up with the new GDP numbers. Um, but 2% of that is going to be dedicated to uh, defense, the first time in Japanese um, post-war history that that has happened, and it's happened massively. It's not just a little bit of an increase. It's it's 100% from what normally was um, earmarked as 1% of the gross domestic product would be devoted to a defense spending. It's now 2%. And the numbers are just out for um, the, the budget that is being requested by uh, the Ministry of Defense. So as you know, if you're a frequent listener uh, to this uh, this briefing, the numbers that are being submitted by the government, the various ministries, um, is this last week. And the prime minister considers those, and then the budget um, goes into um, high drive. And by the end of the year, they decide what the numbers are going to be, and then they pass that um, at the, you know, in spring of 2024. Um, so the proposals are going out now. The, proposal coming from the Ministry of Defense is uh, large. It's 62% larger than it was last year, still re remaining within the figures that were established by uh, the Ministry of Defense and also by the, the Prime Minister. But there are a couple of details that came out, and I'd like to uh, relay those to you. Um, the government subcommittee on, um, uh, what is it, uh, parental uh, custody is going through a, a bit of a, a, a rethink on um, changing the law. So as you might know, uh, parental custody, custody in the event of a divorce or a separation usually goes to a sole parent. And it's caused a lot of problems. It's caused like parental kidnapping. It is particularly harsh on foreigners who marry Japanese. And typically what happens is the, uh, the Japanese spouse, whether it be the father or the mother, uh, typically absconds because of 
you know, they're very well familiar with the, the Japanese rules and um, um, uh, separates the children from the other spouse. And they are allowed to do that. They're protected and um, uh, supported by the government, by the lawyers, by the, um, the legal system and the family courts. Uh, so it's a, it's a real um, shock to uh, most people. I mean, if you're a parent and it happens to you, of course, it's shocking. And it happens quite a bit here because that is the rule. They're undergoing uh, a rethink on that. And hopefully um, uh, they will get some, some, uh, some progress there. It is under consideration now. Um, China, as you might have heard, immediately banned uh, all fish imports from, uh, from Japan. They didn't just focus on uh, Fukushima and the eight surrounding prefectures. As we reported last week, once the water started to be released into the ocean, Hong Kong and China implemented an immediate ban on uh, fish stocks from, from Japan nationwide. That's a big deal. The prime minister took uh, immediate action by earmarking more funds for um, promotion and protection of the fisheries industry. Although there was a little bit of a gaffe there with the uh, fisheries minister um, that I'm going to go into. Um, the U.S. expansion into Asia increases as negotiations with the Philippines are um, moving forward to establish a new um, port in uh, on the northern island of the Philippines to establish a bigger presence there. Um, this is uh, what maybe uh, 200 kilometers away from the island of Taiwan. It's a choke point, and uh, it looks like that is going to be uh, going forward. And in addition to that, the Biden administration, in a pretty rare move, has um, approved a U.S. military aid to Taiwan under a foreign military funding program. Eighty million dollars is earmarked for that. That doesn't sound like a whole lot of money, but it it is a program that is supported by the State Department uh, for sovereign nations. Uh, the support for them to buy U.S. military equipment, training, uh, defense capabilities, and that sort of thing. Uh, Taiwan is not quite a sovereign nation as uh, most people understand the term. So this is a pretty provocative um, uh, move by the United States. And when taken into context with what's going on with the joint exercises with Japan, Australia, uh, the development of the next uh, generation jet fighter between Italy, Japan, and Great Britain, and a lot of these things, um, it is uh, uh, one of these, an, another stepping stone to uh, what eventually needs to be, uh, in my view, a, a revision of the Japanese constitution to allow Japan to have uh, offensive weaponry. As we um, frequently talk about, the grain of Japan and the falling birth rate um, are huge problems for the prime minister, not just for Rapidus, who wants to have high-tech workers in Hokkaido, but also in Kumamoto. They've got um, uh, two big uh, production facilities there for chips, um, high-end chips. Um, and the with the falling uh, birth rate and the number of people who are getting married and actually um, having children and the economy being the way it is, the prime minister is in a real bind. His approval rating now sits at about 28, 27 percent. It is the lowest that it's been. And he's moving into a period where he needs to reshuffle his cabinet. And I'd like to talk about uh, the reshuffling of the cabinet as well. Um, that looks like it will happen. Yeah, there are two windows of opportunity this month. Um, and we'll explore both of those. And uh, under the heading of crocodile tears, um, if you've been following what's going on with Johnny's Gym Show, uh, Johnny and Associates, it is the uh, production company that um, initially produced boy bands, which was very popular, still is very popular here, produces a lot of um, singers and uh, troops that uh, provide entertainment throughout the country, but they also spin off and, and produce a lot of actors, budding actors. Um, they were um, lambasted, or Johnny's Gym Show was lambasted, finally, for uh, the sexual exploitation of uh, many of the boys who were recruited into Johnny's Gym Show by the, the founder, uh, Johnny Kitagawa. And uh, the UN actually sent um, a, a team in to investigate this. The BBC had a documentary on it several months ago. It was huge. It made a lot of news. And finally, the Japanese government is somewhat forced to acknowledge that. And now all of the broadcasters are jumping in and saying, boy, the, the press should have been a little bit more observant there. And um, 
it does look a lot like crocodile tears, and uh, I'll get into that a little bit more. With the um, uh, the release of the Fukushima water, a lot of things have happened, not just the production or the sale of fish stocks uh, to Hong Kong, Macau, um, and China, um, but something strange happened with Toyota on Monday. They had a system failure um, that affected all production for all of their plants in Japan. All of the plants in Japan, Japan produces about 44% of all Toyotas built throughout the world, built and sold throughout the world. So for their production to go down um, for one day due to what they call a systems glitch is very curious, especially in light of what's going on in China and the rocks and eggs being thrown at uh, Japanese schools and um, Japanese companies. It's really, really beginning to boil there. Um, but I'd like to get into that a little bit more. And let me see. That's the top line. Let me get back into uh, the deeper facts of this. So the economy is looking uh, rather sour. Um, um, uh, like I said, uh, Rapidus, which was a consortium of uh, several uh, U.S. and foreign and Japanese high-tech companies to come up with uh, high-end chips. So the Japanese government is going with a two-prong approach in northern Japan because they have to split this up for security reasons. In northern Japan, in uh, Chitosei, they're building a huge production facility called Rapidus. It's a brand new company under the funding of the Japanese government as well for building a uh, very thin wafer, nano uh, spec uh, wafers uh, for the future. And the, there is a, a chip shortage going on now globally and they're rushing to fill that. In Kumamoto, there's a different kind of production with TMS at the lead of that. TMS, as you know, produces the highest end chips throughout the world. Um, and with what's going on with Taiwan, the fear that perhaps China might someday uh, enter into kinetic action for taking over uh, that that um, that nation, that island, um, or maybe even a blockade uh, seems more and more likely given the geopolitics that are going on in the region and things that uh, we frequently report to you here. So um, Rapidus is looking for uh, maybe uh, 500 workers to go up there and help them uh, after the construction for this. And the number of people that are available to that, if they're not being sucked up by private industry here in Tokyo for the big firms, the maybe the Japanese government needs them in uh, the digital agency, which hired 500 people when the digital agency was started about two years ago. And um, many of those who are manning the desks in the digital agency came from the private sector, not the public sector. So they, they left their nice cushy jobs in the corporate sector with the high salaries and they became um, essentially Japanese bureaucrats. So there's a little bit of a difference there in terms of pay. You got a better uh, payout during a pension, you have better job security, um, but it is a, a bit of a shift and the Japanese government is actually lamenting the fact that the young kids no longer hold out a job in the bureaucracy or working for the foreign ministry as their top jobs anymore. Um, the top uh, top um, sought after job is to become a um, an influencer actually in um, in certain industries. So um, it's a it's an interesting um, development that's going on there. But um, as a consequence, uh, the firms cut capital spending um, for the first time in five quarters. That's a almost a year and a half that they've cut capital spending. It's uh, significant because um, they're capital spending um, fell um, for uh, goods and services, excluding software, 1.6% just this last quarter. And if you add in the software for the purchases that companies are making, um, they gained 4.5% in terms of capital spending, but that was lower than what was supposed to happen. It was supposed to be 8.3. So as a consequence, the whole the whole model is being uh, refigured and GDP figures will, revised GDP figures will be coming out on Friday of this week, on, on the 8th of, of this month. So um, it comes to uh, the fore that Japan's growth is heavily reliant on uh, foreign exports as we kind of all know Japan is basically a, 
an export market. Um, most of the big companies are involved in, in exporting uh, goods and services. The largest of these is uh, obviously Toyota and the automobile industry. But um, Japan has its own in, internal um, market as well. Uh, but for growth and for production, and as you know, um, uh, tourism is counted as an export. So the, the growth of, of tourism, once again, um, the Chinese are not coming in droves. There has been an uptick in the Chinese coming, but like with uh, the casino market, uh, it has been predicted without the Chinese coming back in to the numbers pre-COVID, uh, the, the economy is not really going to take off. Similarly, with, um, uh, with the casino market, without the whales that come in from China, um, the, uh, the profit margins and the uh, return on investment is really skewered. So they're looking forward to the Chinese coming back. The fact that the, the water from Fukushima is being um, now spilled out of the containments uh, is, a, is a huge, um, huge bite there. Uh, it is affecting the fisheries industry as well. Um, but they're going to have to uh, revise the GDP figures, which is a big deal. Um, the tighter labor market and the higher import costs are driving uh, all of these factors down. The yen is almost at the same price that we put it at last week. It is now at 146 yen to the dollar. It is pretty much historically unsustainable when it gets to about 148 or 149, and we're very close to that before the Japanese government actually intervenes. Gas has hit a, a high. It's been the highest ever. It's now, uh, most people don't even uh, really follow the gas because a lot of people aren't driving and they're not that concerned with it. But it is at 185 point four yen to the leader and that's the highest it's been the prime minister has said he's going to push it down to 175 which is a a more um, um, average price that the japanese uh, consumers have been been used to but he said i can't do that until october so we've got september and october we've got this month to deal with he's going to shuffle the cabinet his approval rating is low he really doesn't have a lot of good news looking at him and his, uh, his itinerary is just packed this month uh, with the uh, shuffling of his cabinet uh, approaching. He's got a lot of balls in the air. Um, moving on to corporate malfeasance, we talked about uh, crime in Japan. It's not um, as uh, violent crime. There's not a lot of street crime. Uh, there's no robbery, muggings to speak of, no knife point, uh, give me your wallet, that sort of thing. But at the corporate level, a lot of crime does does occur in this country. I, I think it's probably an inordinate amount um, compared to other countries, just because of the structure of the the companies, you know, the hierarchical nature, and the fact that um, you know humans are basically wanting something uh, for free, and if it's on the table or under a glass case, and they can get it, nobody's going to find out, um, even if you're. Um, well-mannered Japanese, you know, the temptation is there. So a couple of things happened uh, just this last week. Uh, part of that deals with just corporate malfeasance uh, globally, but part of it deals with what's going on here in Japan that also has, um, you know, some influence from, from, um, from uh, foreign sources as well. So the first one I want to talk about is 3M. 3M is a huge company. It's based in St. Paul, Minnesota, and they were producing earplugs for the US military. They've been doing this for 20, 25 years for the soldiers who are working with artillery and um, loud noises. And uh, they, uh, the US military purchased a lot of um, earplugs for soldiers that are in that kind of a situation. And it turns out that the uh, earplugs were faulty and this caused several lawsuits, a mounting number of lawsuits and it turns out now that um, over a 12-year period, um, there are 32,000 lawsuits filed against um, uh, the company 3M. The court has just compiled all of these, and it is now going to have to pay more than $6 billion to these people who have been injured as a consequence of using the 3M product, even though 3M knew that it was faulty and didn't do the job it was supposed to do. That's a big deal, Three, uh, $6 billion um, for over uh, 32,000 lawsuits. You have to scratch your head and wonder what was the accounting office doing? What was the 
the military medical office doing? What was what was going on with these soldiers? This has been going on uh, for the last 20 years. So it's it's a it's a big scratching of the head there. More locally, Japan has um, the MUFJ. It's one of the dominant uh, lenders. It's one of the dominant banks in Japan. It has several joint ventures. Um, one of those is with uh, Morgan Stanley. There's actually two. There's Morgan Stanley MUFJ, and then there's MUFJ Morgan Stanley because um, the Japanese bureaucracy said they had to split up a certain market. And so the MUFJ Morgan Stanley, this means that the Morgan Stanley has the minor position there, probably 49% of the joint venture. But with um, MUFJ Morgan Stanley, they were selling stocks that were tied to uh, Credit Suisse, and um, they created these new um, investment bonds, which were called additional tier one. And they had rates of return that were attractive to a certain kind of investor, mostly professional industri um, industrial investors. And what they did was uh, they began to sell those to individual investors, wealthy people. And there were about 66 plaintiffs whose um, investment in this, uh, 5.2 billion yen, uh, since these securities were being sold, they got wiped out and lost all their money, zero, zero return on that. And they filed a lawsuit, and now the bondholders are um, suing um, uh, the, uh, the, the group. Um, and um, the, the holding is that uh, the Morgan Stanley MUFJ failed to significantly apply the risks, and the bonds were professional institutions but they were sold to individuals. So there's this, this insatiable creep of, of these companies to build their portfolios, to sell their product, to earn a profit. And uh, sometimes it gets a little bit out of control. And I think that's what we saw there. Um, we'll continue to watch these, but these kinds of significant um, issues, these legal issues or these crimes that are committed are of particular interest to me. So I hope you don't mind me sharing them with you because they are a window onto other things that are going on. Moving on to defense spending, as I said, um, Fumio Kishida, the Prime Minister of Japan, announced when he became Prime Minister, it was already talked about earlier under the uh, administration of Mr. Suga, the very short-lived uh, one-year administration of Mr. Suga, that defense spending would go from 1% of GDP to 2% of GDP. And Mr. Uh, um, Kishida actually put his, his stamp on that and set the five-year term for a, a huge number of investment. That would be um, over a five-year period of 43 trillion yen, which is about $315 billion. So divide that over five years, $315 billion over a five-year period. So um, we are in year one right now of that pronouncement, and the defense um, uh, the, the Department of Defense or the Ministry of Defense just put their numbers, all the ministries are putting their numbers forward to the Prime Minister at this point in time. Now, that's why the Prime Minister has been so um, occupied this last week, um, uh, going over these numbers. They came up with a 7.7 um, .7 trillion yen uh, budget for the year two. And um, that is a, a pretty big jump. Last year from um, uh, 2022 to 2023, it was a 12% jump. And this is um, maybe a 16% uh, jump from that number. So it stands now at about 7.7 um, .7 trillion for that uh, budget request. And the reason is because they want to build a joint um, headquarters in Ichigaya. So my office is in uh, near Yotsuya in uh, Lokobancho. And Ichigaya is just across the moat from there. So that's where the, they're going to construct this massive joint headquarters. It'll probably take them three years to do it. They want uh, to include that in the budget. They're also purchasing uh, two Aegis-equipped destroyers. And they also need to stockpile munitions for potential um, kinetic action or for defensive actions uh, throughout the archipelago, not just uh, in Okinawa or the islands that are outlined there, but also up in Hokkaido too, because of the uh, the Russian incursions that have been increasing in that area as well. So um, that's going forward. 
Like I said earlier, the, Je the Japanese government is proposing revisions to the parental custody law. This is one of the, I don't know, one of the, uh, I don't know, from, from a foreign perspective, one of the black marks about um, Japanese law and culture and, uh, and living here that uh, in the event of a divorce or a separation, Japanese law recognizes custody of a sole parent. So it turns out that whoever has possession of the children usually gets custody under this system. So it encourages and rewards the parent who is at loggerheads with their spouse to abscond with their children first. So the first mover gets the children and the law basically protects them as the sole, sole custodian. So it's, a, it's a, a situation that really generates lots and lots of damage. Um, there's been lots of complaints, particularly since um, more and more foreigners married to uh, uh, Japanese spouses and having children. It does happen. It's probably um, a high rate of, of divorce or separation. And it turns out that foreigners um, actually have, uh, on average, a, a higher ratio of producing children than the, the Japanese nationals do. Um, and so this issue comes up a lot uh, in, in terms of, you know, what, what the embassies are handling and how they're dealing with the foreign ministry and also the ministry of justice. So fixing this problem is a huge deal. It's one that's been irritating, um, the foreign community for a long time. Uh, so hopefully the recommendations that are being considered now, uh, within the justice ministry, they're going to produce an interim report, uh, to recommend, um, uh, moving from sole custody into joint custody. And we can probably um, expect something in November or December. So keep your, um, keep your eye out for that, as I will. As I said earlier, China um, immediately banned importation of all Japanese foodstuffs. This is a big deal since, um, you know, uh, gosh, what is it? Maybe 42% uh, of all of the fish exported from Japan goes to China and Hong Kong. So um, in, in other um, industries as well, China is... Japan's number one trading partner, as, as you know. So for them to put a ban on, on the Japanese food stock is a huge hit. Um, it particularly hits hard uh, Hokkaido, um, but it hits um, all of the industries. The prime minister uh, visited uh, Fukushima um, maybe last weekend, as soon as he came back from uh, Camp David. Um, Rahm Emanuel was there, the ambassador from the United States. He was there eating sushi. And so there's a whole crew of people that go up there to eat sushi and get their pictures taken to support and endorse uh, the stance of the Japanese government. Not everybody is buying that. China is um, complaining globally about this contaminated water that's being released. And they use this term contaminated water that is being released. It is a word that is somewhat taboo in the Japanese lexicon. You're not supposed to say contaminated water. You're supposed to use the word the um, authorized word, which is treated water. Um, so um, they have cut that off and the Japanese government, um, uh, Nishimura, with, who is uh, the, one of the ministers of state, announced another uh, package of uh, support money that is going there. And originally it was uh, 30 billion yen that was going to be devoted to the fisheries industry uh, to deal with the reputational damage or the, uh, the diminution in the export or the consumption of, of, um, of foodstuffs. So it's mostly export related because the Japanese market is still, I mean, as long as, um, you know, people like the prime minister and uh, the ambassador uh, from the United States are eating the sushi, uh, it receives this kind of um, uh, smell test passage and um, it's, it's the foreign markets that really need to have a, a little bit more of a boost. So the prime minister uh, also announced this last week an additional 50 billion yen of, of support for developing um, export markets and to uh, export uh, Japanese food stocks to account for the 42% diminution they're going to receive from China. We don't know how long that's going to occur with China. But um, there are a lot of fights that are going on between Japan and, and China. There's a lot of controversy there. The prime minister is attempting to line up a face-to-face -face with, um, with the premier of China, uh, Xi. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. There is a uh, ASEAN 
uh, G20 in India uh, in this week. Um, and it looks like uh, Z is not going to attend that. So the prime minister was hoping that maybe he could have a word with them. But it looks like uh, the tensions between China and India are also escalating uh, very rapidly. So who knows? It might turn out that uh, the Quad actually does have uh, its fourth leg firmly uh, established. Uh, we, we, we're watching that carefully. Um, but uh, this... Um, uh, this, this hit to the fisheries market is going to be um, uh, pretty big. Um, and you can expect the, the prime minister and also the other ministries uh, to be um, addressing that. There's also a, a, a kind of a separate piece of news. The um, minister of fisheries, a fellow by the, Tetsu, by the name of Tetsuo Nomura, 70 years old, a little, bit, a little bit getting in there. He had a report with the prime minister on um, Wednesday, I believe. Um, to report on what's going on with Fukushima, what they're doing with the fisheries, how much money is going to be spent and what's going on there. And um, after leaving the prime minister's briefing, you see this on TV all the time, they, they leave there and then the reporters are lined up with their microphones and they take questions. And he, um, in answering his questions, he mentioned the word contaminated water from being released from Fukushima. And this caused a huge firestorm. He almost had to resign on the spot because he used the unauthorized word. It's supposed to be treated water. It's not supposed to be contaminated water, you dolt. And um, so the, um, uh, the uh, chief cabinet um, uh, um, minister um, actually chastised him. Um, he withdrew his comments uh, that night, um, but with the cabinet shuffle um, upcoming within days, within weeks, certainly, it doesn't look like there will be an aggressive action taken for him, but Everybody's been waiting for the other shoe to fall when the cabinet is reshuffled. Who are the people who are going to be replaced? And it looks like he just put a huge target on his own back. Uh, that happened on Wednesday night. So there's a lot going on there. Um, and, uh, and the prime minister is, you know, he's, um, he's fighting battles here at home and he's fighting battles um, uh, elsewhere too. He had a telephone conference with Zelensky uh, once again, promising Japan's support for uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, so on the international front, on the diplomatic front, he's doing, um, you know, uh, a gangbuster job. He's leaving for uh, Indonesia this week, um, perhaps today. He will be in Indonesia for the um, ASEAN. Then he goes to India for uh, the G20. Um, and he returns this um, next weekend. Uh his, um, his faction, which is the Kishida faction, maybe the fourth largest faction within the LDP, is having a uh, summer retreat, a summer um, workshop on the 12th. It's a two-day um, um, seminar. Uh, all of the members of the Kishida faction, I think there are 50, 52 members, 51 members in the Kishida faction there, they will be um, uh, secured in some mountainous um, retreat and talk about you know what they're going to be doing. Um, that will go from the 12th, the 13th, and then he needs to leave um, for uh, New York for the uh, uh, UN meeting. Um, and so there's a little bit of a window of op op opportunity that he could shuffle the cabinet, announce the shuffling of the cabinet at that point, probably around the 14th or the 15th. But then he needs to leave to New York. And before the end of the month, he'll be back from New York and that is the second opportunity that he could shuffle the cabinet. But all of the pundits are saying it's either going to be in the beginning, or, I'm sorry, in the middle of the month or at the end of the month with a slight preference for the middle of the month. Because as he has this conference with all of his colleagues in the Kish Kishida faction um, on the 12th and the 13th, one of the, thing, the things they're going to talk about is how we're going to improve the prime minister's uh, likability and his the appreciation for his cabinet. So one way to... Uh, fix the uh, appreciation for his cabinet is to switch these guys out and put new ones in. It's a risky gambit because some of the people you bring in, they have closets full of skeletons too. So he does want to bring in some new faces. Um, there's a lot of focus now going on for female members. So um, there are, are two uh, females in, uh, in particular who are receiving a lot of attention. One of them is uh, Yuko Obuchi, um, the daughter of 
uh, former Prime Minister Obuchi, and the other one is uh, Yuko Kamikawa, who um, previously was a justice minister and also a minister for dealing with uh, the um, declining birth rates in Japan. Uh, she's gotten high marks. She is kind of the number two to the secretary general of the LDP. Um, and it looks like uh, her star is rising. She's 70 years old, whereas uh, Miss Obuchi is, what, she's 49, I think. Um, yes, yeah, she's 49 years old. Um, so it looks like her star is rising, and the prime minister absolutely must have uh, more women in his cabinet. So these are trial balloons are already being floated out. So you can uh, expect to see it. certainly Miss Obuchi's name coming up. She has been tainted by scandal in the past. Scandal is a component of Japanese politics, as you all know. She was Meti ministry minister, and um, two of her aides were um, implicated in a, uh, a, a fraud for uh, raising funds. It frequently happens. Uh, the um, secretaries fall on their swords. They take the blame. They were convicted. Uh, she resigned as minister. And, but this was, you know, this was maybe, um, what, 20, 15 years ago. So she has been um, cl um, clearly, you know, separating herself from that as ministers and as uh, members of the parliament are wont to do. These, these positions are typically um, lifelong positions as long as you can survive and convince your voters to keep voting for you. And with Miss Obuchi, even though there was a scandal and even though two of her secretaries were convicted as a, as a consequence of that, her father was prime minister. He died in office, actually. And um, so um, she is a, a competent and well-liked um, member of the LDP. And I think uh, you'll be seeing her name uh, very quickly. Uh, we'll probably be talking about her next week and certainly the week after when the um, uh, cabinet reshuffle is finished. Moving on, let me go to um, the United States expansion in the rest of Asia. We've been talking about this group of like-minded countries, Japan being bound to Joe Biden and his, um, his uh, coalescing the forces to be a deterrent to China moving on Taiwan. It is a very large, very sophisticated um, uh, construction of all of these nations. Quad is a part of that. Uh, Five Eyes is a part of that. The trilateral relationship between Japan, Korea, and uh, the United States. They just finished their summit in uh, Camp David last weekend. All of these things are really building up to a point where one um, inescapably must be confronted by the fact that the Japanese constitution does not allow for Japan to have that massive, it doesn't allow it to have an army, it has a self-defense forces, um, but with the amount of money that's being devoted, uh, Japan's army is, is clearly in the top five um, um, military forces in the world. And uh, this is increasing. And uh, they really, with what's going on in Taiwan and also what's going on with Russia too, Russia is, is really beginning to um, saber rattle in the northern territories. You've got Hokkaido and then the four islands that were taken over by Russia at the end of World War II. There's a lot of tension that's going on there as well. So the Japanese need to um, really be uh, armed to the teeth defensively, but they also need some sort of offensive capability that they've kind of agreed to the United States to be that vanguard for them. It does come at a cost for the Japanese, um, particularly with regard to uh, relinquishing uh, large parts of Okinawa to host uh, U.S. forces and to allow them for training um, and that sort of thing. But as we've reported here before, um, these um, uh, the airspace that was pr pretty much reserved in Okinawa for these military flights has been extended throughout the, the whole of Japan. So uh, U.S. forces, uh, military forces, can do training and flight exercises throughout all of Japan now in a, um, an agreement that was reached and was implemented about two weeks ago. We reported on that. So a lot is going on here, and we, um, we're watching it very carefully. The United States has, has made an agreement with the Philippines to develop a, an existing uh, commercial port on the northern island of uh, the Philippines 
to make that uh, susceptible to military um, naval exercises and um, equipment and re, re, uh, um, positioning, uh, resupply of uh, naval vessels, not just uh, American, but you know throughout the um, the like-minded countries. So this this is really building that um, that island is what um, maybe forty four. Um, 200 kilometers away from uh, from Taiwan. So this is beginning to build uh, at something of an alarming rate. And the other thing that's uh, somewhat alarming is the United States passed through the um, through the legislative process this um, $80 million uh, fund for um, helping Taiwan rearm or get more sophisticated equipment from the United States. And this is uh, managed under the State Department, not under the Department of Defense. So it's an interesting aspect of um, this uh, funding program that is typically geared towards sovereign states that are friendly to the United States that might have uh, border issues with people who are unfriendly to the United States, uh, this going to Taiwan. And you've got to imagine that that's uh, very upsetting to, uh, to China. And um, uh, we'll see what the Chinese reaction is going to be. But you can be assured that it's not going to be uh, quiet. But this was just announced this last week. Um, moving on, um, the grain of Japan and the falling birth rate is reducing the number of people who are actually available to go to work, even though um, uh, the, um, the companies continue to grow, continue to increase their profits. Um, they still need workers to do that. GDP is directly tied to the number of people you have um, in your nation. So um, the number of babies born in Japan, to, and now they're including Japanese expatriates too. So they're including for birth rate, not just the Japanese nationals in Japan, but they're also including Japanese expatriates. That means Japanese who are living overseas and also the foreigners who are coming into Japan. So they've, they've done a little bit of a trick with the number because the numbers, the declining numbers, I think are so alarming. So they're adding more into that. But it fell 3.6% from the year earlier. And you might remember that Japan announced last year for the first time that births fell below 800,000 uh, births uh, for the entire nation. So it's the first time that that's happened. Um, and the pace of the decrease in births for the first half of 2023 slowed down from 5% during the same period of last year. So um, I don't know if that slowdown in um, numbers is a consequence of them including Japanese expatriates and the uh, foreign community that is in Japan. But the, the fact is, is that um, Japanese people are marrying uh, later in life, if they're marrying at all, the males in particular, but I guess that's a double-edged sword. You, you're not going to be get, getting married to uh, another male. Well, I guess you could. But it has exacerbated uh, the declining birth rate that the, the time and the, uh, the time for getting married is going later and later. Um, but again, particularly for the males, they're waiting to their mid-30s or 40s, whereas uh, Japanese women are typically getting married in their, early, in their late 20s or early 30s. Um, and the number of births um, uh, in the six months up until June fell 7.3%, while the number of deaths rose 2.6%. So uh, there's a, in, in a population decline overall of uh, almost half a million people. And um, so the government proposed in a white paper that they just produced, achieving structural wage increases is important to address the country's declining birth. So when you think about it, that's a, a real tough nut to, to crack because if wages prevent people from having more children and you need to increase wages, does that mean you just um, enhance wages for people who are in the uh, birthing uh, age? And how does that um, impact people actually getting married in anticipation of having children? So um, it's, it's a big deal with the Working men in their 30s, the percentage who were unmarried rose as annual income has fallen. So for those that are in the lower economic zones, they're getting married even later and later. And the white paper said that it is important to raise the incomes of young people calling for reduced financial burdens from rent and education and correct 
the excessive burden of raising uh, children on women. So there are two people that we're talking about today, uh, Ms. Obuchi and also uh, Ms. Uh, Kitamura, who were formerly ministers of uh, addressing the declining birth rate. And they're female and they were assigned that role. This is a new initiative by the, the prime minister to address that issue, to put money on it, to figure that sort of thing out. And these, these women rising in prominence to cabinet level is, um, it's a big deal and it also highlights uh, the, uh, the amount of, of energy and uh, devotion of the prime minister's time that we can expect to be devoted to that. Um, let me see what else I've got. Johnny's Gym Show. Um, we can get into the details there, there if there's a, a lot of interest. But overall, the, uh, the fact is, is that the broadcasters are now lamenting the fact that the broadcasters didn't do anything about it while Johnny uh, Kitagawa was abusing these kids. And this has been going on since the 60s. So in the 60s, he was a high school teacher. He, had, um, he was um, a basketball coach. And he put together a boys band and it was started from even back then. He became a little bit more famous as these um, boy bands that he put together began to go public and sing songs and cut records. And he formed this organization called Johnny's Gym Show, which he was the king of. And in fact, Boonshun, we'd like to talk about Boonshun because although the polite press uh, frequently doesn't deal with issues that are of relevance or even uh, might be false, um, Boonshun does. Boonshun digs into these issues. Uh, it is frequently um, referred to as a scandal rag. It does talk about scandal, but it talks about um, other things too. And its uh, reliability and its um, consistency has been proven over and over again. In the, uh, I think it was in the 70s, uh, they came up with a, a 14 week series on Johnny Kitagawa and the abuse of these kids. 14 weeks. I mean, it is difficult to imagine anybody surviving being focused on by um, Boonshun for two weeks, let alone three weeks. Uh, the prime minister has a, a close aide uh, that he has right now, uh, Kihara, who is um, um, not a minister, but is uh, advising the prime minister. He's involved in uh, a scandal. Boonshun has been reporting on him for six consecutive weeks, and certainly he is going to be uh, shuffled out in the when the cabinet is reshuffled. And by the way, when the cabinet is reshuffled, as you know, it's not just the cabinet, it is the vice ministers too. It's, it's like a, a tumbler in a lock. A lot of changes go through throughout the system, including the, the three main positions within the LDP. Those are also changed out in a cabinet reshuffle. So there's probably around um, 1,200 individuals who change seats uh, during a cabinet reshuffle. But um, Boonshun reported 14 weeks in a row on Johnny Kitagawa, and it didn't really do anything. There was a lawsuit brought by one of the fellows who was mentioned in Boonshun. He lost his lawsuit, even under the court system. And now he's coming back with a vengeance and um, with the BBC that announced or that, that played its documentary about two months ago, three months ago, and the UN um, Commission, Commission on Human Rights Violations coming in maybe uh, four weeks ago. They were here for 10 days and then they had a, a big press conference. Huge black eye for, uh, for the Japanese, for the Japanese media, for the entertainment industry. Um, it's a little bit of a, a, a window on, um, it's not really a, um, um, a vote against uh, the Japanese people, but it is a, a focus on the industry and how they were able to allow something like this to go on such a clear violation of human rights and it was all just swept under the rug. And now that it's out in the open, people are pointing fingers and lamenting it. And I call it uh, crocodile tears. Anyway, with that, I would like to um, wrap up this part of the, um, of the briefing, Maya. We can get into any of these issues if they've piqued your interest or if you want to get a little bit more deeper into them. I'm happy to go into that. And I welcome your uh, comments and questions. By the way, as you know, we don't charge for this, but we really appreciate if you hit like or subscribe, or you provide a comment. Our uh, engagement is just through the roof, Maya. When we hold these briefings and the Q and A's, uh, the the level of engagement we have with the audience is is really astounding. And I very much appreciate it. And thank you, uh, and thank you, Maya, for everything that you do. You're going to turn on your mic one of these days. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, that's are you with uh, capital letters, but yes, for your consistency and commitment. And yes, we do have uh, a couple of comments uh, in Clubhouse, also uh, on LinkedIn. And uh, so Deborah is um, well. She, Hi, Deborah. She is yes in Clubhouse, and uh, she uh, mentioned there that. Well, it's not only Johnny's Jimusho, but uh, of course, a lot of other agencies uh, have been um, or are guilty of um, this problem and actually not doing much to solve it. So uh, it seems um, that the, the industry, the whole industry actually uh, has this problem. And, um, you know, lots of people probably have been aware of it, but they haven't reported or maybe they haven't been heard. Uh, well, you see, you see the same thing going on in Los Angeles, too. I don't know if there's actually a, a, a causal relationship that's going on there, but a lot of pedophiles have been identified in, in the industry in Los Angeles, too. So I don't know if it's and, and maybe Deborah is right that it, it's a component of this kind of industry, that this kind of quality of performer or these kinds of um, um, individuals who uh, uh, ascribe or, or uh, uh, aspire to that that um, kind of um, art, um, maybe there's something to that. I, I hadn't really uh, considered that, but great comment, Deborah. Thank you. Right. Yes. And then, um, okay. Let's see. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, just reading the comments in Clubhouse. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mario, for your understanding there. And yes, I'm moving to the comments in uh, on LinkedIn actually now. Uh, the first one is from uh, Gabor. Gabor, thank you for 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 it. Timothy, I'll read it out to you so uh, you can share your thoughts on it. So the comment is: Is the reason behind the brutal Chinese punishment the export control? on chips and semiconductors by China. Okay, it is obviously not about uh, radiation or food safety. The Chinese communist leadership is the last one to take care uh, of uh, the health of its people. The whole <laughs> thing reminds me of uh, 2010 and 2012, or recently the ban on Australian wine and Taiwanese pineapple. China hits where it thinks it hurts. Yes. So your thoughts on this, uh, Timothy? Well, first of all, Gabor, um, uh, and, and for everybody that's in the audience and for people who are commenting, please reach out to them on LinkedIn, on, on Facebook. Gabor has a great Facebook page. Gabor, thank you very much for uploading those pictures of you and the family. Um, on your vacation, I really enjoyed that. You got a beautiful family, and and I love following your post. But the Chinese, yes, they play politics in in a bit of a different way. Um, they they usually take a yeah. It's just a different way of of doing politics. The Commerce Secretary was in uh, Beijing just this last week. She took a huge delegation there to try and calm things down uh, because it's not about. Um, disengaging. It's about engaging in a different way to create better security for uh, trade flows. But um, yeah, the, when, when the, the Chinese government is angry with you, you know, um, Japan released the treated water and all of a sudden rocks and eggs are being thrown at uh, Japanese schools in, uh, in China and uh, insults hurtled. Uh, the Japanese embassy is also um, violently attacked. Not too violently, but you know enough to show that there is displeasure among the population of China about what Japan is doing. And of course, since China is that kind of a, a country, it's not very far. The Chinese people are not acting too far out of the, um, the eye of the government. So you can imagine or interpret that part of these activities that are going on are receiving the blessing or maybe the guidance of the the Chinese government, but yes, when when they're upset at you, uh, you hear about it in a very vocal way, and I think the it's just it's part of this this um, this fight that we have, and it's um, it's across the board. China is Japan's largest trading partner, and it's taken a huge hit, and the Japanese economy, as a consequence of that, is taking a hit, and so the United States is attempting to help facilitate that, and um, I'm sure uh, Mr. Uh, Biden was 
told by Mr. Kisha, you should, you could help us by, you know, importing more sushi. You know, we're having trouble with sushi and uh, we could use a little bit better cut on the, um, on the oil that, that we're getting um, uh, elsewhere, the LNG, for example, uh, much of it coming from, from uh, Russia up in the Sahalin. Um, but yeah, the Chinese do the, play that game a, a little bit more obviously. Um, and so I don't know how long it's going to occur. And it looks like, you know, the tensions will remain high and the trade will be the weapon of choice before it goes uh, a little bit more kinetic. But there is an awful lot going on. The reposition of U.S. forces and other um, like-minded countries participating in war games, for example. Uh, there was a huge war game exercise in um in North Korea, just this last weekend, they attempted to fire another rocket. It failed in uh, mid-flight. So he's um, um, uh, Kim Jong Un is still continuing his um, his march towards um, you know nuclear or missile dominance. And he just announced this last week. I don't know how realistic it is by um, uh, equipping uh, naval vessels with uh, nuclear weapons as well. So um, a little bit off of what um, uh, Gabor was mentioning, but Gabor is a, a careful student of what's going on in China too. I always appreciate him participating in our, our briefings. Thanks, Gabor. Yeah, thank you. And I also think that uh, there is something, you know, I'm going on a tangent here, but at the same time, we have seen that uh, the nuclear energy industry hasn't been very active in actually explaining the science. Uh, behind uh, nuclear energy and if they had been more proactive in doing that maybe you know um, the Chinese government uh, wouldn't have been so successful actually in uh, telling the Chinese people that uh, the fish there is uh, radioactive and so on and so on so um, it's... I don't know I think any crooked toenail will do in the current environment any crooked toenail will do um, okay. But, you know, it's not to diminish that the release of uh, nuclear tainted water, you know, is is a concern. It should be a concern. I mean, and it's going to go on for 30 years. So we don't know what's going to happen. Um, and also, <clears throat> as uh, uh, Lori likes to um, talk about quite a bit, you know, that you're not getting the full story from the press. Mm -hmm. you, you really need to um, have other sources of information so that you can make the right decisions and get the right information and draw your own conclusions because uh, the, the corporate press is not giving you the full story, even if it's uh, the Japan Times or the Nikkei, uh, you're not getting always the full story. Right, yeah, uh, that's true too. Okay, I continue with the, the questions from LinkedIn. Once again, this is Gabor. And his question is, will I I know him. <laughs> okay. So will Akimoto be arrested before the extraordinary <clears throat> diet session? So here's um, the, the better question is, is he going to be arrested before the 12th? So mm -hmm. the 12th is the deadline that if he is arrested before the 12th, then there must be a runoff election for him before uh, the end of October. That will be a, a by-election. There are two elections that are going on today. There's uh, two um uh, by elections for um, uh, uh, local um, municipalities. One is for a mayor's race. And the LDP is not doing, their candidates are not doing particularly well in those races. And the, the results will be uh, announced tonight in the news um, with a pretty high degree of confidence that the winners will be accurate. And if the LDP doesn't win these two seats, or if it only wins one, I think it might likely win both of them. It does have, once again, this reflection on the LDP, on Mr. Kishida, on the cabinet, on his approval rating. So it tells you that he really needs to crank up the velocity of the changes he's going to initiate in a cabinet reshuffle, because that's all he's got. The only thing that he's got is the cabinet reshuffle. He's got the, the um, treated water issue that he's dealing with. He's um, going to the G20. Um, who knows what's going to be happening there if he's going to be lambasted for uh, polluting the Pacific. We, we just don't know. It, typically, these are um, more polite and uh, more diplomatic um, meetings. But, you know, China's not going to go. I mean, Xi is not going to, to go because of what's going on with, um, between him and India. Uh, so there could be some fireworks there. But the prime minister is on a very busy schedule. 
And just when he catches a breather, then he's going to announce the uh, the shifting of uh, seats in his cabinet. Let's hope it works. But, you know, um, as a barometer, uh, what's going on with the municipal elections tonight? And then, as Gabor says, there will be an extraordinary diet session. The prime minister is going to talk about that with his Kishida team on the 12th and 13th. Then he will uh, shuffle the cabinet and he will announce when he's going to have the uh, extraordinary diet session. He hasn't announced that yet, but we all anticipate it. And then he's going to talk about how much money he's going to give everybody so that they like him again in the extraordinary budget. So let's see what happens. But yes, there's still more fireworks as, uh, as Gabor's uh, comment um, suggests. Yes. And uh, one more question from Gabor. It is, as for the cabinet reshuffle, what are your bets on change? Takaichi, Kono leaving? Leaving? Do you think that they will leave? or? I, I didn't understand the last part. Okay. Do you think that Takaichi and Kono will leave the current, the government, uh, well, the cabinet? Uh, yeah, well, I think, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think Kono will, will leave as um, digital minister. Um, yeah, I think he, he'll, ch he'll change. But he could ac accept a, another uh, a position, and it might be an LDP position. Um, uh, Takaichi um, was candidate for prime minister. Um, I think she is um, good to go. She's not well liked by the prime minister. Uh, she's a bit of a thorn in his side, but she does round out the, the cabinet as a, um, as a, a female, um, and so she you know, the prime minister gets points for that. But I think he has to have a few more females in the, the cabinet. And there there are some great candidates there. Um, who knows? I, I would like to see um, uh, Matsukawa Dui in a, in a cabinet post. It's about time for her. She's in the upper house and she was involved in a bit of a, it's not a scandal. It's just, I think, a, a flare up where she was in Paris and um, she was criticized for having too much fun on a LDP junket for uh, team team building. Um, but I think there, there will be quite a few changes, Gabor. Um, I think you already know the answer there. The, the Minister of Fisheries, uh, Forestry um, and Agriculture will definitely be changing because of his gaffe just on Wednesday that he talked about um, contaminated water rather than treated water. So of course that's a mortal sin. Um, and he's a, he's a bit, doddering um, uh, physically anyway. So I think the prime minister needs to come up with a plan where his cabinet is fresh, it's vibrant, it represents the Japanese uh, aspirations for moving forward. Um, and he's, you know, he, he has very few tools in his toolbox now. Uh, the economy is not going his way. Uh, militarily, uh, things are a bit dicey. He's spending more and more money. He's committing more and more money. And people don't know where it's coming from. And I think there are a lot of people that are saying, you know, you've got to raise, uh, especially from the Ministry of Finance, you've got to raise the consumption tax because otherwise you're not going to be able to pay for everything. You're making all these promises. And where's the money coming from? You can charge, um, you know, five yen for every extra cigarette that you smoke. Uh, you can sell off NTT and Japan tobacco and some of the assets that the Japanese government has. It doesn't cover the bill. You need to come up with something a little bit more robust and um that could either end his career prematurely, or at least it's going to forestall him from having a snap election that he was so hot on three months ago. Mm. Yes, one thing that I noticed, you mentioned that there will be uh, probably two new uh, female ministers in the new government, and still there are only two. <laughs> you know, it's a kind of sad because you say that, yes, the prime minister needs more women and still we, we, we don't get more than two. So, of course, I'm also aware that there isn't enough um, in, you know, the number of uh, women uh, in politics is not big enough uh, actually to probably, um, you know, allow for more ministers. But still, it's kind of a sad reality. So. Well, we, we've talked about the, the international report that pegged Japan as, you know, mm. 140th in 160 companies in terms of, of diversity and in terms of representation. And they said that it would take 60 years for Japan to reach some sort of representative parity politically. So in business, it's a different kind of mix there. But politically, it's a very long um, 
a very arduous um, way to go. And maybe it's because of the culture and the, the fact that women aspire to politics. It's they're they're fewer and they have a higher um, mortality rate in terms of not um, not dying, but just not being able to succeed themselves in election after election. Um, so it's a complicated issue, but yes, definitely the prime minister needs to have more women in his cabinet. So I think you're going to see um, uh, uh, maybe even uh, three three women there. Uh, it's, it is possible. Well, let's hope. We can always hope, yes. Okay, and so in Clubhouse we have, uh, well, somebody, Navin. Uh, hello, and thank you for joining us. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, I, I can. Thank you. Great, thank you. What's your question or comment today? Uh, yeah, uh, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is always scary. This um, is always so scary. Nadine? Naveen, Naveen. Naveen, how are yeah, you? Yeah. Welcome, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it, man. Um, so the first question is like, um, uh, do you think the current uh, American president, you know, is actually uh, doing better in terms of Japanese American relationship uh, comparatively towards uh, Trump or Obama? Yeah, I think I think he is. Um, although I'm I'm leaning uh, far more towards Trump. I think he was a bit dis divisive and talking about the Japanese paying your fair share. And that really um, put uh, the United States in, in a level of insecurity by the Japanese. Um, and I think he was tough on, on trade and reciprocity, um, probably rightly so. But uh, Joe Biden, I think, um, in, in spite of the, um, yeah, I don't know if I want to get that far into it, but um, yeah, I think the the Japanese U.S. relationship is um, is good under the the Biden administration, and I think he is uh, really dedicated to helping the prime minister because the prime minister is dedicated to helping Joe Biden. You can see that, and there's no hesitation uh, when when there are opportunities to facilitate what the United States wants done. The prime minister is always there, so I think the the relationship has has uh, flourished to a, a large degree under the Biden administration. Okay, thank you. Uh, my, uh, my second no, question. No, go ahead. We were talking about that. Uh, sorry, uh, about uh, uh, more, uh, you know, like say uh, women in politics or like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, diversity is a very important thing, that's for sure. But um, when it comes to politics, you know, like it could be a hot take from my side, but I'm saying like, uh, you know, Meritoc, I mean, merit-based thing would be better than just for the sake of, you know, wanting someone who's there just because he's a woman or like a transgender person or something like that. Like, uh, you're talking about Japan so, now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the merit-based argument is really, it's not a winner, I think, especially with the appreciation that the, dot, that the population has for uh, the current cabinet and for the prime minister. So when they produce these surveys, there's one, how do you, what do you uh, think of the prime minister and the job that he's doing? And the other question is, what do you think of the cabinet that he's put together and the, the job that they're doing? And the cabinet scores low, but the prime minister scores lower. And you can increase that by having, yeah, it's, it's not eye candy. It is actually it, it tells people something when you have more women represented there, it, more women will actually go out and vote and they'll be more participatory in uh, Japanese politics or at least in voting. So it's not all eye candy in any way. Even if it was eye candy, there are lots of ministers of state. There are lots of Japanese politicians that really don't belong there, but they're there for a lot of other different reasons. But people don't ask those hard questions because they're male and it's a male dominated society. So of course they're going to rise to the top. So sometimes we don't even have those kinds of conversations just because we're so clouded by the um, the meritocracy of uh, rising up through the ranks. And I think you have um, in the Japanese bureaucracy, yes, you you see that a lot, but it doesn't happen so much in Japanese politics. In Japanese politics, it is likability and how many times you've been repeated to serve 
in, in a diet capacity, not so much in the upper house where it's a six year term, but in the lower house where it's rough and tumble and, and it's, you've got a four year term and almost always you're gonna have an election before your four year term is up. So you never know what's going on. But if you survive four or five times, it means you're, you're good to go. <clears throat> and, and while we're on the topic, I hope you don't mind if I uh, uh, diverge just a little bit to talk about the Abe faction. Are you familiar with what's going on in the Abe faction? Uh, not in detail, though, but uh, I, I like to hear it today. Okay, the Abe faction is the largest faction in the LDP. They have their lunch meeting every Thursday. And this last Thursday, they had a meeting where uh, Shionoya-san, Shionoya Du, who was appointed in the last lunch meeting to be the leader, but not the chairman. And he's not the 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 leader of the Abe faction, but they appointed him as kind of the chairperson for this committee. And in the committee meeting on Thursday, they decided who's gonna be in the committee. And they've decided it's gonna be five or six or seven people, people who occupy cabinet seats or high level seats. So the um, chief cabinet secretary, Matsuno is, is in the um, Abe faction. And there are other prominent people, Hagiura, for example, who is in the LDP, um, policy affairs chief. Um, so these people are definitely going to be in that committee, but the vast majority of members of the Abe faction, about 62% are members who have been in the diet less than four terms, four terms or less. And they're saying, hey, you guys, you big shots, you're calling all the shots and we know that you're gonna be protecting yourself. What about us? We have 62% of, of the numbers here and you guys are giving us short shift and you're kind of pushing us around. We want a, a, a better representation. So it's still a lot of confusion going on there. Meritocracy doesn't always solve that problem. A lot of it is hereditary. Who is married to Mr. Fukuda's uh, daughter or who is friendly with uh, Mr. Mori? Mori is uh, welding a lot of weight these days. And then you've got uh, different factions there. So I, I, I'm sorry, I've, I've gone on and on, on, but it's a great question about meritocracy or family relationships or heredity. It's it's a very confusing, complex mix. And one of the reasons why I think um, our briefing is so popular is because understanding it, it it's really takes a lot of history and um, and background to be able to you know figure out what's going on and what's going to be happening. So I appreciate your question. You got another one? Actually, like that. Uh, yeah, but when it comes to like, uh, like say, like when people just say, you know, just a blanket statement without knowing the actual, you know, details, like you know, like you're like an expert on the expert on expert on the shit, okay? So, um, uh, people say like, you know, we need to see more women on a thing, but then it's not based on sexism or something like that. It's just like this deep, uh, you know, system or hierarchical, hierarchical or whatever, like political system where it's not based on totally on meritocracy on also like you know like it's just politics basically so you know like uh, if there are like uh, women you know who are like totally you know embedded in that stuff and you know they know what they're doing they'll be represented for sure i mean uh, you know rise up in, in the ranks or something like that so well are you are you familiar with the um uh, the slogan women shine Oh, okay. No, that is women shine. Okay. Yes, women but, shine. But, uh, for people who don't, uh, who don't speak Japanese. <laughs> okay. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You got yeah. it, right? Yes. Yeah. So that was that was a slogan, um, actually, that the former prime minister Abe came up with. Women shine. We want you to excel. We want you to participate. We need you because otherwise we have to bring in more foreigners. So get to work. Come on. We'll give you more positions of power and authority. You just need to kind of have gumption come up to it and that didn't actually work and yeah. so now we're going through the the process of is it going to be the foreigners are we going to bring in more foreigners more foreign uh, technicians and professionals uh, we can hold our nose and they are coming in they're bringing their families and their dogs I, I is is there anything else we can do let's let's extend the retirement age from maybe 62 to 65 or 66 so uh, there's a lot going on here, but a, a great question that pulls out a lot of things about go what's going on in Japanese politics and culture and psychology. So um, thanks for joining us. You got another one? Mm, thanks. 
ஆக்கியுமெண்ட்ல because he spends a lot of money overseas and yeah. gives a lot of money to other countries rather than spending all those um, resources on uh, domestic issues and it seems to be really uh, something that a lot of people actually i mean an opinion that a lot of people here share as long well, as i, I have... think he's i think he's taking his playbook from joe biden <clears throat> okay probably yeah so if you live in hawaii definitely you hold that same view right? <laughs> okay Yes. Yeah, All so right. There's a there's a lot going on there. But there is some impact that is enjoyed by a certain level of voters and particularly LDP voters that the prime minister shining globally, externally, mm-hmm. diplomatically really reflects better on them rather than, you know, who he has as his minister of economy who is doing a good job or who is doing a bad job, but the prime minister He's, you know, people remember who he is. I mean, that was one of the great things about Mr. Abe. First he started out as Abe, and then finally they got around to calling him Abe, and that was a great success. It only took eight years, but um, with Mr. Kishida, he would really like to succeed uh, Mr. Abe's, um, you know, legacy. Um, mm-hmm. He's two years into it. Yeah, the the jury is still out on that, but uh, I completely agree with uh, Hiroko's um observation that uh you could spend a little bit more time at home and and help us here with the flooded areas in in uh Fukushima uh, in uh uh, uh where where's it in in Kumamoto and also in um Niigata um but I think the prime minister is doing as well as he can and he was the longest serving uh, foreign minister uh so you've got to um kind of anticipate that he's going to go where his strengths are and i think he's done a a very good job um globally diplomatically hosting um you know the g7 and getting everybody to go to visit the hiroshima uh, war museum and and some of the other successes that he's had but he does have quite a few problems and not all of his own making the economy just really sucks it's sucked for 20 years 25 years um but yeah these promises about changing things and throwing money at it Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um probably uh, a lot of that are just, you know, empty promises and hoping to get from day to day. Well, we have seen uh, before that uh, actually how uh you know, the actions of uh, the prime ministers are actually appreciated overseas and uh, domestically are two different things. So Yeah. Probably, yeah. So we'll see how it 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 goes of course with uh, PM Kishida. And, But I appreciate uh, Hiroko's uh, comment because yeah. this time it wasn't to correct my pronunciation or to, uh, <laughs> you know, make sure that I had all of the the um, uh, ministerial no. posts. Yes, Shionoya yeah. held, and thank you very much, Hiroko. You're you're so fabulous to be on the on the team. So yes, Hiroko is coming up on stage. Here we go. Good morning, Hiroko san. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, Maya san, Kimasi san. Good morning, everyone. Actually, my uh, comment was uh, related to the, my question on the LinkedIn. It's about uh, Sri Lanka uh, oh. seeking the uh, Where is help. That? I from... haven't been. Oh, okay. <clears throat> right. Uh, yes, yes I'm, I'm. I'm keenly it's interested right. to hear the comment about Sri Lanka. It is. It is really uh, hot these days. Right, and uh, they have they have uh, suffering the debt from the China, and they were not able to repay them, mm-hmm. China. So they're seeking the help from a uh, Japanese government. I, and I was wondering if you have any information or, or comments on that. Um, that that leads to my comment on that uh, Kishida's uh, unpopularity. Right. One of the uh-huh. reasons he spent on the other countries, whereas he should uh, focus on that uh, domestic issues. So that's that's what I wanted to ask you. Hiroko, can I ask you a question about your um your connection with Sri Lanka? I have no I'm a market researcher, so I'm 
very curious about uh, the, what is happening in the world, especially related to China. <clears throat> okay, so um, even a, a casual observer knows that uh, Sri Lanka, formerly known as Ceylon, the Spice Islands, it was the jewel of the um, of the Indian Ocean. It was the stopping place for all of the Spanish galleons and, and trade and the each Dutch Indies um, um, maritime um, trading that um, that really propelled uh, England to be the number one dominant empire in the world. Um, and Sri Lanka was um, uh, pretty much um, exploited by um, many of the, the large money managers. Same thing that happened with with Venezuela and Argentina, where you know Goldman Sachs and the IMF went in and they fixed things and they purchased or they helped them um, get public works projects and to help them build their infrastructure and that sort of thing. But people were really making a lot of money off of that. And not only that, <clears throat> as it became um, you know wildly obvious uh, in the last uh, three years that the level of corruption at the higher ends of, of government was just um, uh, so outrageous. And so the people exploded. They weren't able to have uh, gasoline, the, the food, and they got hit by the tsunami pretty hard as well. Um, and then, um, you know, they were they were hit with, you know, the repayment obligations that they had because of these, these big um, infrastructure projects. They uh, defaulted on their loans. They were hit by that. And then, of course, the Chinese came in and said, you know, we'd like to be friends with you. You are a strategic location. We'd like to buy you um, or help you build some ports and some facilities and um, maybe an airport or two, and we're good friends with you. So it's all part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And who can deny that? Who can, you know, when you're in that kind of situation, of course you're going to accept it. And now just even just a couple of years later, the, the Chinese are saying, you know, it's, uh, you know we're, we're going to um, take over the land and the, the facilities that we uh, built for you because you can't pay us back for it. So it's all of, it's this rape and plunder that just continues to go on. Uh, people don't acknowledge it for what it is, but it's the, the big countries and the big corporations that go in and they, uh, they manipulate the, um, the, the currency exchange. They, um, they tempt the, the leadership with um, sweet deals and um, you know, getting uh, the funds uh, earmarked for um, you know, producing uh, these bonds and that sort of thing. So yeah, Sri Lanka is, is really sad. Sri Lanka is not the only sad country. There are a couple of other ones. Look what's happened in, in, in South Africa. They've already had a, a couple of revolutions. Uh, because of what's been going on with the French and, and the Belgians in exploiting the mineral wealth there. And now the, the people have just had it. And so there's a coup d'etat that's going on there. So this, um, I don't know if it's a, if it's a, uh, a kind of a global turn of what's going on socio sociologically and geopolitically, but it does seem that we are moving towards this this uh, critical point, um, perhaps um, something akin to World War III, that just uh, recreates the, the, the world order and establishes a new one. So out of destruction comes a, a new beginning. But it does have that, that sense of, of uh, those forces coming together. The United States um, clamped down on sending chips and condensers and high-end chips to China. They just announced that they're going to do the same thing to Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia is now falling into that camp. So you got Saudi Arabia, you got China, you got um, you know uh, Iran, you've got all of these things that are kind of really ratcheting up. It's um, it's really worried some for somebody like us who are on this briefing uh, that follow it to, um, to kind of put those pieces together and watch this this slow march towards something that uh, could be a kinetic and, and very uh, global uh, event. But uh, it's a bit of a um, a diversion from talking about Sri Lanka, but Sri Lanka, uh, they've just had these riots, these food riots this last weekend. Uh, they've gone through an election. They have a new prime minister there, a new president who is uh, attempting to pull things together. But um, yeah, it's a hotbed of activity there. I And, and then the Chinese, um, you know, beginning to um, exert their influence. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's something that we should all be watching and be very concerned about. Thank you so much for your insight and explanation. Yeah, I'm uh, keep eye on um, the development of these stories. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Hiroko. And uh, well, Timothy, uh, well, 
I am happy to report to you that we seem to have <laughs> exhausted the comments. Yes, just one, you know, from Binati. Uh, on LinkedIn, uh, in many ways, colonization has simply changed the uh, forms, hasn't it? Definitely. What a great observation. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. It's, 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 it's the big companies. It's the Mon Monsanto. It's the Cargill. It's the mobile oh. oil. It's it's yes. all of these these big ones. And they're, you know, they're running things. You know, if, if you think yeah. Joe Biden is the president of the United States, it's it looks like that. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm not in a position to say if you think Kishida is running the government. I, I think it. I I think that's a more accurate statement. But what's going on in the United States and the EU? What's going on with Ukraine? All of these things. It's just. It's too curious to be actually uh, describing the reality of what's happening uh, behind the scenes. So uh, yeah, I I very much appreciate your observation. Yeah. Thank you, Binati. And uh, well, Timothy, before we get any more comments, <laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> running away. But... You lie. <laughs> <laughs> no, OK, I'm sorry. Uh, I know that you have a lot of things to do, of course. And uh, well, everybody wants to enjoy Sunday as well. Welcome, everybody, to September. So September school starts. The kids are in school. Everything yes. starts uh, uh, new in September. We move out of baseball season into football season or soccer season. So th there's a, a huge change that's going on. And pretty soon you can't wear your summer suit because even though it's hot, you're not supposed to. So <laughs> there is a lot of change in the air. I'm very much looking forward to a, um, a vibrant and hopefully a cooler uh, fall. But they do say that uh, this winter is going to be rather severe here in Japan. So it's up again. It's down again. Um, thank you very much for tuning in and following us every week. I hope you get something out of this briefing. And uh, if you do, you know, continue to be engaged and hit like, tell, you know, connect with uh, Maya or me via LinkedIn, yes. uh, YouTube or uh, on Facebook. Yes, definitely do. Please do. And uh, also, uh, I want to tell you that uh, this Wednesday, we're going to talk about um, cybersecurity. So uh, Wednesday, eight o'clock in the morning. Please join us. And then once again, next uh, Sunday at 8.20, Timothy will be here reporting again about Japanese politics. So that's all for today. I'm not you have a great speaker lined up for uh, the Wednesday briefing. So yeah, yes. everybody, please tune in for yeah. that. Yes. OK, that's all. And uh, thank you very much, Timothy. Keep your face, keep smiling at you until we end the live stream. Thank you. <laughs>